I bought this mystery PC at a recycling center for just $10. It caught my attention for a few reasons. One, it appeared to just be a mini ITX board in an awkwardly empty case, but also because it looked like it had some potentially interesting features, at least for a computer that I bought for just $10. Is it any good? What can you even do with it? What the heck even is this thing? Well, let's find out. If you're an avid viewer of the channel, this system might look familiar. This is actually a PC I picked up back when I was doing my $100 smart home video. I was rummaging through a bunch of old computers at a local IT recycling place when I found it, and since no one really knew what the heck it was, they accepted my offer of just $10. I hoped it would be a cheap system to run Home Assistant OS on and stay under my budget. However, I figured out that it doesn't support UEFI, and I ended up switching over to a different system just to keep things moving. But I never actually took a look at this or even figured out what it was. Opening it up, you can see that, oh, well, it's a little bit dusty. Fortunately, that should be pretty easy to get cleaned out thanks to this B10 Pro Max air duster from Fantic. This little guy is super tiny, but seriously powerful, hitting up to 130,000 RPM. It's got five different speed settings, plus a one tap boost button. So it's perfect for any job, from trying to clean out a very dusty 13 year old Mac mini, or just playtime with Ruth. It also has really solid battery life. I've been using it for multiple projects over the last few weeks, and yeah, it's still sitting at 80%. Plus, it just charges via USB-C, and this even doubles as a portable power bank. It also comes with a bunch of handy attachments for different jobs. I ditched cans of compressed air a long time ago, but I always just use this big, bulky AC power duster because anything battery powered just seemed underwhelming. But this has officially become my go-to option. And speaking of go-to options, this S2 Pro electric screwdriver has become another one. I've never really been big on electric screwdrivers, but well, this one won me over. It has seven torque settings from 0.5 to six newton meters, so it's just as good for electronics work as it is for random projects around the house. One of my favorite things is how well the case is designed. It props open while you're working, holds 20 common bits, includes an extension and the 90 degree adapter, and even has a thoughtful little cutout so you can charge the S2 Pro while it's in or out of the case. I'm not joking when I say that I've been using these constantly. We've been trying to get our house ready to sell, so there's been lots of little projects and cleanups, and seriously, these have been getting used nonstop for the last few weeks, and I highly recommend them. If you're interested, you can get 50% off the B10 Pro Max or 35% off the S2 Pro. Just use my codes and links that are on screen or down in the description. All right, now that it's dusted out, let's talk about what this actually is. When I first bought this, I saw a sticker on the case that showed that it was from a brand called Contec, and the model appeared to be a Catalina with four gigabytes of RAM and a 64 gig SSD, which that all checked out. But I looked everywhere for this Catalina system and couldn't seem to find anything. But this didn't seem to be like a fully custom system or anything. It really just appeared to be a mini ITX board inside a, well, a very empty chassis. The motherboard had some stickers and model numbers as well, but I didn't have any luck with those either. It was really only after I powered the system on and saw what the CPU was that I was able to eventually stumble upon this motherboard from Aeon, the EMB CV1. This looked exactly like my motherboard except for a few slight differences. This board has two SATA ports, which mine didn't. It also had a SIM card slot, which mine didn't as well as some audio outputs and some various other connectors that mine didn't. And basically it seemed like my motherboard was this model. It was just a kind of a suckier version of it. I really have no idea what this context system was used for or what exactly it was called, but my best guess is that this was made for some customer or product line and Contact just needed a very simple system. So they purchased a semi-custom industrial motherboard from Aeon with the same CPU, chipset, etc. But they saved a few bucks by not including some components that wouldn't be needed. And then this case, well, my best guess here is that they just repurposed the tooling for a similar case that also housed a Flex ATX power supply or something similar at the top. But they didn't need that power supply or whatever else might have been in this case, and well, we just ended up with an extremely generic looking and oddly empty chassis. Anyway, they made that system and sold it to someone and then they threw it away, and then now I came across it and well, I'm hoping I might be able to find something useful that I can do with it. Probably not anything too CPU intensive though because the Intel Atom D2550 in this thing isn't setting any benchmark records. This dual core from 2012 does support hyperthreading, but only has a clock frequency of 1.86 gigahertz. That being said, it also only has a TDP of 10 watts, which would explain the lack of a CPU fan. As it said on the sticker, the system came with 4GB of DDR3, as well as a 64GB MSATA SSD. On the front of the system, there's, well, there's just a power button. On the back, there are four USB 2 ports, dual gigabit network interfaces, VGA and DVI connectors for video, and then two COM ports for serial. 
Oh, and I guess I forgot to mention this earlier, but this also has a DC barrel jack for power because, well, it doesn't need an ATX power supply or anything. It just runs off of a 12 volt power brick. On the inside, there are two DDR3 sodium sockets, the M SATA socket, a PCIe by one slot, and then some headers for a few more COM ports, an 80 millimeter fan, and well, that's about it because all the other cool stuff isn't on this version of the motherboard. So yeah, there's not a whole lot going on here. That's not to say this system couldn't be useful though. Probably not as a desktop system. I mean, it doesn't even have any audio outputs, but since it doesn't even have a CPU fan, it probably doesn't draw a ton of power and it might work well as a little mini server or something. As I mentioned, I got the system powered on without any issues and got to the BIOS menu. Here, there wasn't anything that interesting to take note of. I was able to get Debian 13 installed on the MSATA SSD, and as I usually do with systems like this, I tried to see just how little power this thing could consume. I ran PowerTop Autotune, as well as this Auto ASPM script, and after that, the system was idling at just around 8 watts. With how little power we were drawing, I didn't imagine we really needed to be blasting that 80mm fan at the front, so I disconnected that, which brought the idle power draw down to below 7 watts. Now, I was a little bit worried about CPU temps, but after running a stress test for multiple hours, I never saw CPU temps get above the low to mid 40s. And when running that stress test, the system was still only drawing like 12 watts. So already it looked like this could function as a dead silent, passively cooled system that just sips a few watts from the wall. But can it actually do anything with those 12 watts? Well, kinda. I ran Geekbench and ended up with single and multi-core scores of 90 and 233 respectively, which if you compare that to something like a Raspberry Pi 4, yeah, it doesn't look too good. But hey, it was still at least a little bit better than the EPC I took a look at a little while ago, and that thing was drawing over twice as much power at idle. Before actually trying to put this to use in any sort of meaningful way, I wanted to see what upgrades and expansion might be possible. The D2550 supposedly only supports 4GB of DDR3, but I tried just plopping in two 4GB sticks of DDR3L, and well, it actually worked just fine, giving me a total of 8GB. To try out the PCIe slot, I dropped in this 10 gigabit NIC, which, yeah, that was beyond optimistic. I, I wasn't really expecting it to work that well. I knew this was only going to be a buy one slot, and well, I assumed it probably wasn't going to be PCIe Gen 3, but I was hoping that it would at least be PCIe Gen 2. However, this thing only supports one lane of PCIe Gen 1. That means at best you could use this slot to add like a single gigabit NIC or one or maybe two SATA hard drives. I think this actually might be the only singular Gen 1x1 PCIe slot I've ever come across, which it's a bit sad. Now there isn't another PCIe slot, but according to the specs of the EMB CV1, it seems that the MSATA slot was also functional as a mini PCIe slot. Mini PCIe and MSATA share the same physical connector, but often they aren't wired up for both. And I assumed this wouldn't be either, but well, the specs seem to indicate otherwise. And the board even had WLAN silk screened on the motherboard. So I dropped in a little Wi-Fi card and then booted from a Debian live image to test it out. But well, yeah, my assumption was correct. This in fact did not work. I'm assuming this was another cost cutting measure on these boards, but realistically it wouldn't have made that big of a difference if it did work because, well, I need something to boot from. Now I halfway considered trying to solder some SATA ports onto those unpopulated spots on the board to see if it actually worked. But even if they did work, I'm pretty sure that I could only still have a total of two SATA devices working in total just due to the SATA controller that's on the board. So I figured it was probably smarter to just use the M SATA port that works rather than potentially melting something on the board with my shoddy soldering skills. So yeah, there really isn't much to upgrade or expand here. We're kind of just stuck with the system as it is, but that's not to say we still can't find some ways to put it to use. Now, I didn't even try this out as a desktop system because, well, there's not even an audio output. Also, the Intel GMA 3650 graphics are not great. And well, the CPU performance just probably wasn't going to be up to snuff anyway. And so it just seemed like it wasn't worth it. So I figured I'd try to play into what seemed to be the strengths of the system. Anytime I see multiple NICs, my brain always jumps to building a DIY firewall. And with this, you absolutely could. However, you might not have the best time. Uh, the dual NICs in this are Realtek 8111Es, so if you're going to be using OpenSense or PFSense, you might run into some issues due to proper driver support. I did give OpenSense a shot, and the interfaces were actually detected just fine with the default drivers, so that was good. However, the performance wasn't incredible. When connected from my laptop, I was typically getting around 500 megabits per second, either when testing online speed tests or a locally hosted open speed test server. The CPU usage wasn't crazy high or anything though, so I would attribute this performance more so to the real techniques. If you don't plan on running a ton of firewall rules or VLANs, and especially if you have less than a gigabit internet connection, this, this might work, but really this might make more sense as more of a test system to tinker around with and such versus more of a production system. Now, as is with most systems, you could get by hosting some lightweight services with Docker containers. 
with those GMA 3650 graphics, any sort of video hardware transcoding is absolutely off the table. So I don't think you have a great experience with something like Plex or Jellyfin, not to mention the fact that you would actually need some drives to store media on. But anyway, uh, you also aren't going to have a good time doing anything CPU intensive, like running game servers. But if you're just looking for a little server that doesn't draw a lot of power to run some lightweight services or Docker containers, this would probably get the job done. Which that actually gets me to what I really wanted to do with this thing, which, well, is do the thing I originally bought it for, running Home Assistant OS. As I mentioned, Home Assistant OS requires UEFI support, which this system doesn't have, but I actually ended up finding a fairly easy method to get it working thanks to this Reddit post. Long story short, using a live Linux USB drive, you just flash the Home Assistant OS image onto your SSD, but then you also add another partition and manually install and configure Grub2 so that your system actually boots up properly. After doing that, Home Assistant fired up just fine and worked as expected. Honestly, with this drawing so little power and being completely silent, this could work really well as a dedicated little Home Assistant box, especially if you added on a Zigbee radio or something. In fact, I plugged in this little Sonoff dongle and then just added a Zigbee smart plug in a few seconds. Honestly, I think with how I use Home Assistant, this thing would be plenty. Although if it were up to me, I'd probably try to like 3D print a little tiny case for it or something that doesn't take up as much space. All in all, this little system is, well, it's not much to write home about. It offers very little in terms of CPU performance or graphics capabilities. This specific version of the motherboard offers next to nothing in terms of upgrades. And the case that it came with is, well, this, but if you don't need that much performance, the minimal power draw is fairly impressive considering the age of the system. You don't need a fan, meaning this thing can be dead silent, you get two network interfaces, and the whole thing can just be powered via a 12 volt power supply. I think for just 10 bucks, this wasn't too bad of a deal, but well, what do you think? And what would you do with the system if you had it? Let me know down in the comments. And hey, while you're down there, maybe consider giving this video a like, maybe consider subscribing to see more, or becoming a raid member for as little as a dollar a month. With that, you get early access to all of my videos without any ads, which I think is a pretty good deal. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I can't wait to see you in the next one.